For years, John Ibbotson has argued that Canada has taken an irreversible shift to the right and that the Conservatives would become the new natural governing party. Does last week's Liberal victory put an end to that theory? Let's find out. In the nation's capital, there's John Ibbotson, writer at large for the Globe and Mail. And John, it's always great to have you on TVO. How are you tonight? I'm great, Steve. How are you? Just terrific. Thank you. Let's uh, start by showing uh, three maps that kind of tell the tale from a week ago. First of all, if we can, here's the map of the country with uh, still broad swaths of blue in western Canada, obviously a lot more red in central and uh, maritime in Atlantic Canada. Uh, as we flip over to the next map, we can take a look at what southern Ontario did. Still lots of blue on that map, obviously in the uh, hinterland of southwestern and central Ontario. And then, of course, if we look to the greater Toronto area, well, that's where uh, Team Trudeau really shone. Three patches of blue uh, in an otherwise sea of red and no orange seats at all. Um, John, let's just pick this up this way. You, um, you obviously wrote in, in uh, your last book that you thought that the, that the values that most Canadians were now starting to exhibit, particularly in the suburban, exurban, and rural parts of the country, suggested that uh, conservatives would be in ascension for a long time to come uh, at the expense of uh, more liberal and or progressive forces. Did anything happen last week to shake you from that view? Well, we got too cocky, that's for sure. Uh, when I say we, Daryl Bricker and I uh, co-wrote The Big Shift, which, which is the book that argued that there was this great shift in population towards the West and in immigration uh, towards um, suburban Ontario and that these immigrants were more conservative than immigrants have been in the past because they come from places like China and India and the Philippines, and therefore there was this um, this conservative shift underway. Uh, but we inaccurately predicted that it would probably lead to a conservative victory in this election. When we wrote it uh, back in 2012, Justin Trudeau had ruled himself out of contention for the leadership of the Liberal Party. So Daryl and I didn't see any way that the Liberal Party could come back uh, without Trudeau at the helm, and he wasn't at the helm. Well, of course, he changed his mind. He did come back, and he won this amazing victory. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It is the most impressive political campaign I've ever seen in my life, from third to first, from 35 seats to a majority government. It was an astonishing achievement. But the book did say that there would be uh, a center-left alternative to the Conservatives, that it would emerge over time, and that it would win elections from time to time. This is simply one of those times. This is simply one of those times, but I've got to believe that on election night, as you saw the Maritimes come in, Atlantic Canada, in fact, 32 for 32 for the Liberals, then 80 seats in the province of Ontario, 40 in Quebec. I mean, these are uh, historically very, very high numbers. Part of you, John, I'm guessing, started to cringe a bit, yes? <laughs> well, no, look, it, uh, you, you can never cringe because the voters uh, choose wisely, and they chose wisely in this case, too. The, uh, the Conservative government of Stephen Harper had been around for 10 years. It was old, it was tired, it was getting nastier and nastier. Uh, the, the Ford brothers uh, at the end of the campaign. So, I mean, I think a lot of us were... were you know, even people who tend to incline towards the Conservatives naturally were looking at Stephen Harper in the last uh, weeks and months and going, these guys, uh, they, they, you know, they're, they're, be they're well past their best before date. So congratulations um, to the Liberals for emerging as the alternative. Again, Daryl and I thought that the alternative was likely to be the NDP. Um, and at the beginning of the election campaign, it looked as though it was the NDP. But Thomas Mulcair faded. What, what matters, though, is, again, the core arguments of the book. One of those core arguments is that Ontario's long-term interests and values, especially the interests and values of suburban immigrant voters in the 905, the ridings outside the city of Toronto, are at odds with the long-term values and interests of people in Quebec and Atlantic Canada. And I, we, we believe, and actually we have a column in the Globe Mail tomorrow talking about this, we believe that Justin Trudeau uh, has a contradiction to contend with, um, you know, once he actually is in government and looking at his caucus, because he's going to find that different elements of the caucus, especially those east of the Ottawa River and those west of the Ottawa River, 
um, have conflicting values and priorities, and he's going to have a challenge uh, trying to uh, keep them together, just as Brian Mulroney had exactly the same challenge uh, when he had much the same caucus in 1984 and 88. And in fairness to you, you didn't say in the book that the conservatives are going to win every election from here to the end of time. You did say that, you know, progressive forces would win the odd one here and there, but you were making a larger comment. To that end, let me actually just read an excerpt from The Big Shift right now. The Laurentian elites don't realize that Canada no longer belongs to them. A country that was once white is becoming brown. A country that was once part of the Atlantic world is becoming part of the Pacific world. The provinces that mattered most don't matter as much anymore. The country's center has shifted west, and power has shifted with it. In fact, power is now shared by two groups, you tell us, Westerners and Ontario's suburban middle class, especially the immigrant suburban middle class. In terms of power and priorities, nothing else and no one else is as important. I want to follow that up, John, if I can, by showing a couple of graphics here. Page three now, if we can, Michael. This is, this is first of all, 2011. And you talk a lot, of course, about the immigrant vote in those suburban and exurban ridings around the greater Toronto area. And a lot of that went, vote went conservative in 2011. People, if you're looking at this thing, just look at the colors. You don't need to look at all the riding names and the percentages. Look at the colors. A lot of conservative blue in that map. If we go to the next chart, here's what happened a week ago. A lot of those blue ridings fell. A lot of those, you know, ethnically uh, diverse, immigrant-dominated ridings are now red. They just are. This is across the whole country. So uh, I, I guess in some respects it's the same question, John, but let me sort of put it again. Does it make, given what happened the other night, does it make you doubt at all the values or the priorities of immigrant groups that you thought you knew so well? Not over the long term. Uh, again, uh, I spent two weeks in Mississauga Centre in May uh, talking to as many people as I possibly could, a whole lot of people, and, and most of them immigrants or visible minorities, as Stats Can likes to say, some of them had been born here. And again, the values, beliefs that they, that they communicated, are, which are also borne born out in all sorts of polling data, um, suggested that on the whole, uh, they inclined towards c conservative values. And in, and in May, they weren't even thinking about Justin Trudeau. They were giving Thomas Mulcair a bit of a look, but they weren't even thinking about Justin Trudeau. Obviously, that changed and changed emphatically. But will, will it change over the long term? Again, immigration continues to, to come in at, uh, immigrants continue to come in at, at record paces. In fact, I just, uh, just uh, this morning, the StatsCamp produced a new report, showed Canada's between 2011 and 2014, so after the last census, Canada's growing a little over 1%. That's a very healthy number considering most developed countries aren't growing at all. Two thirds of it is immigration, only one third of it is actual births, and all of it is in the West. Uh, M Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta had the top three uh, growth rates in the country, and Quebec, Atlantic Canada, and actually even Ontario were below the national average. So the core arguments are still there. The West is growing in power and importance um, and political influence. That can't change. Um, immigrants continue to come into the country. They come in from conservative societies such as China and India and the Philippines, and that's not changing either. Daryl and I don't see over the long term how those two things can continue happening without advantaging conservative governments. Now, this leader is better than that leader. These circumstances are better than that circ those circumstances. The kneecap debate might have, might have influenced it. You know, history is a, a series of, of tectonic forces, great slow-moving shifts. And, and it's those tectonic forces that Daryl and I were talking about. But any given election is a crapshoot. Um, we just think over time, the big shift uh, advantages conservative parties. Did you see the little uh, bit of fun BuzzFeed had at your expense? Yes, I laughed. I tweeted it. It was a great review. Uh, and, and I could totally understand people who, especially people in the Laurentian elites, uh, popping champagne corks and saying that book is on its way to the remainder bin. Uh, but I think in 10 or 15 years from now, um, we'll, people will still be looking at, the, at, at our arguments and saying, you know what, they had, there was truth in what they said. I don't think anybody has a corner on the market on truth. Uh, if we were that good at, at predicting things, I'd be in the stock market, not in journalism. <laughs> but I think on the whole, over time, uh, the, the big shift argument points to trends, big tectonic shifts that are underway in the country um, uh, that, that can't be stopped unless you decide to close the door to immigration. Well, here's a, for those who did miss the, miss the uh, BuzzFeed uh, 
quote-unquote review of your book. We'll read a little excerpt of it here. It goes like this. Remember in the early 2000s when the liberals were in power and everyone was predicting they would keep winning governments in perpetuity? The authors make a few solid jabs at that ridiculous notion. Now the conservatives are in power and it is they who will perpetually win. Don't like it? Well, then you're living in the past, amigo. The conservatives are here to stay, the authors conclude, and if people don't like to hear that the source of their frustration is their inability or refusal to accept this truth. Now, uh, okay, fair enough. There's a bit of snark in that comment, and you can handle that. There's no doubt about that. But um, key question, it seems to me, is, is, is the, are the results of last Monday more a statement on how you got it wrong or more a statement on this prime minister's time was done? It's both. Daryl and I got it wrong about this election. Three years ago, we looked at where the Liberals were trending and where the NDP was trending and where the Conservatives were trending, and we said, hey, you know what? We can, we can just about call the 2015 election. That was dumb. You can't call an election three years out. We got carried away. We were, we were as I said, far too cocky. Um, but again, the, 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 the core of the book, the, the big trends of the book that we talked about, uh, I think um, are as valid today as they were uh, on October 18th, the day before the election, and they won't change. It'll just remind us all, uh, including pundits uh, who might be listening in, um, to be careful with your prognostications. A, a, a hedge here and there is usually not a bad thing. But I, that was a book where we were just trying to, we were just trying to get it out there. We were trying to throw this idea down on the table about the decline of the Laurentian elites in central Canada, about the rise of the West, about the big power that, uh, that immigrants were, were exercising. And then, by the way, we got that right. I mean, the immigrant mm -hmm. vote in the 905 decided the elections. Justin Trudeau wouldn't be prime minister if he hadn't swept the 905 the way he did. That vote is crucial. It's everything. And if you can predict it, you can, in fact, predict the next election. Hmm. As a guy who cares a lot about uh, national unity, I wonder whether you are uh, concerned about how that map of the country looks today. And by that, I mean you've got the Laurentian elites, as you have described them, in Quebec and Ontario sort of back in the driver's seat. You've got Western Canada still very, very blue, although the Liberals did manage to penetrate a few seats in the province of Alberta. But the map today, strangely enough, looks a lot like the map in 1980 when Justin Trudeau's father was prime minister. And we know, we know that relations between East and West back in those days got pretty terrible. Any concerns on that for you? Not a lot. Uh, in fact, if I were going to try to rebut the argument that Dale and I put together, hey, pay me enough money, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I would look at, the, at, at those gains in Calgary and in Edmonton and in Winnipeg uh, and in the Lower Mainland and say, look, the Liberals are actually starting to penetrate the West um, in urban centres. Those are great beachheads uh, that c could, in fact, grow. I don't think they will. I think, fundamentally, uh, the, the West remains a more conservative culture. But you could argue that I'm wrong that way. Uh, more important, you have two major political parties uh, that have good representation across the country. The Tories, we tend to ignore, but the Tories made you know, significant gains in Quebec. Uh, the Liberals obviously made gains in Quebec. The co election in Quebec was fought on national issues, not on Quebec-specific issues, not on issues of, of sovereignty uh, versus federalism. That's great news. Um, so I think on the whole, the country has never been, and this, by the way, was another core argument of the big shift, the country has never been more confident, more united, um, uh, more optimistic about its future uh, than it is right now, and with good reason. And in that sense, the fact that we have a bit less regional division than we used to have in the past, um, those election results, I think, are encouraging. Fair enough. Let's, uh, in our remaining moments here, see if any of this sounds familiar. Uh, I'll ask our director, Michael Smith. We've got clip number two, bottom of page five. Let's roll that now, please. One of the lines in the book was, everyone in Ottawa was liberal, especially the Conservatives. Uh, <laughs> because the Progressive Conservative Party inherited the same broad intellectual tradition as the Liberal Party. It had the same priorities, essentially, as the Liberal Party. Okay, is it fair to say today that everybody in Ottawa is essentially a Conservative thinker? Uh, or maybe everyone is a liberal, especially the Conservatives. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the Conservative Party is going to have to uh, face this question going forward. I mean, if, if another way if the, the big shift could be disproved is if the Conservative Party splits apart um, into, its into its inherent components uh, between sort of red Tories and uh, former reformers or between socially progressives and socially conservatives. The, the party uh, does have that 
that tension within itself, within the coalition that has to be resolved. So they're going to have to have a debate. Uh, they're going to need to find a new leader who can un unite the red Tory and reform parts of the party, who can speak to Ontario immigrant suburban voters uh, while also speaking to voters in the West and while uh, holding on to the gains that they've made in uh, Quebec and finally getting some of the uh, old traditional red Tory back, uh, vote back in Atlantic Canada. Um, if they get the wrong leader, then parts of the coalition will split in, uh, in rejecting whatever leader they, they chose, whether it's uh, someone who's too much on the red Tory side or someone who's too much on the reform side. Or you could lose Ontario if, um, if, if the, the, there's a sense that the party is now not as pro-immigration as it used to be. Those are tensions within the conservative movement that, that need to be resolved, but they can be resolved. Stephen Harper resolved them, and, and because he resolved them, he got 10 years as prime minister out of it. Um, if, they, if the conservatives find the right leader, they will be very competitive in the next election and in elections after that. Do you have a view yet as to who that leader might be? Absolutely not. Uh, I will watch it all with great interest. As will we. John, great to have you on TVO as always. Take good care. Thanks, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.